architecture is not something that operates on the space of only one site. Anything on a site is connected to all parts of the city and to multiple people and different things happening around it. It can be, in my mind, it can be a bench that creates public space. That's architecture to me. Welcome to another episode of Creative Mind. I'm your host, Bobby Brill. In this episode, we look at architecture, but not the steel and glass postcards of a city buildings that one normally thinks of when we talk about architecture, but we get down into the community design and community building that goes on in architecture, whether it be building for low-income housing, whether it be building for affordable housing, whether it be building for community areas that are used by the people who live in a specific part of town. This is architecture, and it's not something a lot of us think about when we think about architecture. But our guest today, Samina Satabkan, is an expert in this and is one of the coordinators of the school's B-Lab, which specializes in community outreach, community architecture, and building a better world for people to live in. It's a really fascinating talk because if you're interested in community outreach, even politics, uh, industrial design, and architecture, this might be something that helps guide you in your career or gives you a focus in what you want to study. So definitely take some notes. And before we start, please hit subscribe on whatever device you're listening to so you never miss an episode of Creative Mind. And here is Samina Satabka. You are the head of B-Lab at the Academy of Art University or the founder. What is your role in B-Lab here at the Academy? I'm technically the coordinator of B-Lab, but I pretty much started B-Lab in collaboration with a lot of other people in the department, with my directors, with other faculty at the beginning, but I'm kind of the main person that it falls on right now. So I teach in the program and I also do all the outreach around bringing in clients and projects. In a very small nutshell, what is B-Lab? B-Lab is the community-based design program within the undergraduate architecture program at AAU. The goals are fostering diversity, equity, and advocacy for future designers, future students, and bringing spatial justice to the communities around us. How is that architecture? Because I didn't hear you talking about a giant building. Basically, what I believe and hopefully other people in the program believe, is architecture is not something that operates on the space of only one site. Even a building, anything on a site is connected to all parts of the city and to multiple people and different things happening around it. It can be, in my mind, it can be a bench that creates public space. That's architecture to me. It can also be a huge development that creates a brand new community from scratch. So the bench and the whole development, they both create community. So that is my definition of architecture. Okay, well, that, that makes sense because oftentimes the the building becomes the visual postcard of the city. You hear that a lot. The bird's nest in Beijing, the Empire State Building, the Sears Tower, the Eiffel Tower. This is the postcard view of the city. Yes. But the city is everybody else and everybody that lives in it and everybody that visits it. And, you know, they have to sit somewhere. They have to do something. There's something, a community around this that after the construction's all done, people still live here, right? It's about the experience of that building and what it does for your neighborhood, for your space. It's not about a sculptural object in the corner that you can't access that looks pretty sometimes when you look at it. It's how that building interacts with you and all the people around you and how hopefully, I mean, I don't know if this always can happen, but hopefully it makes life better. And hopefully it improves upon your experience in your life and doesn't detract from your life, <laughs> from your happiness. <laughs> no, that, that, that makes sense because I know a lot of, you know, when you're talking to sculptors and, they're, and you're talking about public art, it's the same idea. And sometimes public art can be open to a lot of yeah. interpretation. But working on some of these projects like we had Point Perch, Unity Pavilion, some of the food carts we'll talk about, they are definitely something that is a useful thing as opposed to a, hey, look at that. Take my picture of it. I'm going to go to Yes. It. How did you get involved in community research, which 
as a parent, that's the first thing to go. How are you going to make money? Because you know, if you're doing community research and or community outreach, yeah. you're not going to make any money. Why are you not Zaha Hadid <laughs> and making these billion dollar buildings? How did you get interested in this vein of architecture? I am a first generation Indian South Asian. I was raised Muslim. I was born in Los Angeles and raised there. And my childhood was like really weird and cool and dissonant and strange and everything because I grew up in the 70s and 80s. Um, I was like the only person that looked like me where I grew up. And so it, it was very strange. So I always felt like an outsider. And as I moved into architecture, I also felt a little like an outsider. So working in spaces of diversity in places that fall outside the radar of you know architecture with a capital A, it, it feels more authentic to who I am. It feels like, you know, I, I can wander through those identities and I feel more comfortable there. So that's kind of the very personal reason why, why I think I got into this line of work. I just sort of gravitated into it. That makes sense. I mean, a lot of people forget that if you're going to do something you love, it helps to also enjoy what you do. How does one study or how does one get the experience to do something that is you know, a community project as opposed to, you know, the giant building? You know, I mean, one of the reasons I teach and that I love teaching this program, I, I, I don't, I don't think this should be a separate field from working on fancy buildings with huge budgets and developers. I think areas where, you know, people are marginalized or architecture is, are underserved by architecture. Those are huge opportunities. I mean, affordable housing, is one of the areas right now that's booming and it's carrying through this recession and the COVID economy and it's still on fire because we need it and people need it and there's money to be made and there's firms doing the work. You know, they're totally viable professions. And as we move forward, I think, you know, getting architecture everywhere, bringing design to everyone is only going to increase the amount and the need of architects and take us away from those very like pristine high-end commissions. I mean, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in LA, so it's all concrete, a palm tree and ranch homes. So everything looks bleh, <laughs> if that's a technical term. And affordable housing kind of looks bleh and just yeah. ugly. And and it's taupe and stucco yeah. for miles and miles and miles and miles. In LA, just since you're talking about it, if you look at the work of Michael Maltzen for Skid Row Housing Trust, if you start looking at some of the designs he's doing, they're still affordable budgets, but they're really experimental, cool, crazy architecture. There's nothing boring or simple about it. You mean you can not spend a lot of money and still look yes. cool? How dare you? <laughs> <I know. laughs> God, that's, not what, that's not what it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's not easy to look cool on the cheap, but it, it can be done. <laughs> okay, well, let, let's talk about that. Yeah. So when you were in school, was that the focus that you were going for? I went to um, the Southern California Institute of Architecture, SciArc, in downtown LA. And I went right when they moved into this old freight depot in downtown LA in the Arts District. So it was a really exciting time where they were kind of plugging into downtown LA. Um, it was kind of cool. But prior to that, my undergrad was in urban planning. And I worked for the city of LA in the housing department. I got this weird random position that was with leftover funding from the Northridge earthquake. And we had neighborhoods to work in and we had to assign affordable housing funding to specific buildings and people and projects. So we did a ton of community engagement and we did a ton of work. Affordable housing is a city requirement or a county requirement when you're zoning an area. What exactly is affordable housing briefly? You know, the city has certain percentages of affordable housing that they are striving to to reach. So they all new projects have below market housing. So I believe new projects have to have 12% affordable housing. And then there's a lot of weird things that happen when a developer builds a new market rate building in exchange for getting to do that, they have to build like a hundred unit affordable building. So there's a lot of negotiations and transactions and things that happen to get affordable housing in the city. So in big cities like LA and of course the Bay Area, that's, that can be a very touchy subject, It is, but a good thing. I mean, uh, developers have to build something that people can afford yeah. Yeah. does make the community more diverse. Any housing is the right thing to do. Just build, 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 get the housing in there, flood the market, and then everything will, you know, theoretically calm down. <laughs> so you went from urban planning and, and housing development and 
right from there did you immediately start working on big projects or what was some of the projects you're working on as an architect? I worked for a very small firm after Cyrix because I wanted, I found working at small firms really, you really cut your teeth and you learn how to do everything and you get the whole project. So just you kind of fell on my lap. The first couple of projects I did were, well, there was the house for the woman with 66 cats. And then my boss. Is, is that how it's presented? <laughs> this is the house for the woman with 66 cats. Exactly. Go uh, build. 66 cats, six dogs, and some pigeons. But if you want to get technical. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but the firm I work for, it was called Tracy Stone Architect. She also did animal shelters. So right away, I went back into sort of public projects. It was a city-owned animal shelter. And it was this really cool outdoor design with solar panels and spaces for people to meet animals. And we just kind of dove into that. And after I left that job, I went to a firm that was doing charter schools in LA. So then I started working in schools and we did this really great project along the Alameda corridor in downtown where we converted a textile factory as they were actually making jeans, you know, the big Buddha brand jeans on there. And we converted it into two charter high schools. And so that was a really fun project. And we did it with a lot of partnership from the community, from the city, from the charter school providers. So we got like really into the mix in that project. So that was really fun for me. That's interesting to me. And I think a lot of people don't realize that as you're telling me this, it kind of dawned on me is that if you're building a building, an architect is required all the time. It's not just, I just go off the shelf as a developer and go, eh, give me a building plan B school done all jurisdictions are a little different but for the most part at least in california you need an architect a licensed architect on any building that is not a two-story single family residence made of wood <laughs> okay so so there's a lot of opportunity then as as an architecture student and as a young architect to like you said cut your teeth doing some cool stuff yes you can you can actually design there's a lot of designing going on uh, there's a lot of projects to be worked on. So it, it is a requirement, but it's also... There's a huge range of projects to be working on. And lots of architects are diversifying into, you know, community-based design and animation and set design and all these, like, so, the beauty of architecture, at least for me, is that so many different fields come to touch architecture, lighting, interiors, landscape, you know, all these different fields come to touch architecture and it kind of is the overriding thing that connects them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, but no, but that, that makes sense. Cause it, it's, it's interesting when you look at smaller communities up here in the Bay area uh, and certainly everywhere else. And we have these second, third, fourth tier cities that are becoming more popular for people to live in where you have these renovations of factories, older buildings being turned into something new that, it requires an architect and is a chance for something unique and interesting to be done as opposed to gut it, slap up some drywall and, and throw up a for lease sign. Demo it, put up a Walmart, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dollar general, whatever, whatever, whatever <laughs> makes, whatever totally ruins the landscape. So from there, what, okay. I got to ask, uh, you know, I, I have my notes on it, but I'm, I'm going to ask and we're going to spend a little time on it. We may cut it, but I went in there. Tell okay. me about the cat mansion. <laughs> Okay, so this was um, for a couple that lived in Riverside out in kind of a more rural part of Riverside. And she was a woman who had inherited property. She was Japanese American. She had studied to be an architect. She had gone to RISD back in the day, but then gave it up, moved to Vegas, became a car dealer, met her husband, who was a saxophone <laughs> player at the casino she worked at. They got married. Her mother moved in with them and she just started adopting cats. I kind of didn't know exactly how that happened. She loved animals and she had no place to put them. So she had them in trailers. So she had about like 10 trailers with like six cats each in them, you know, sorted by personality and, <laughs> she, had this property and she wanted to build a house. And once we started the, you know, the design work with her, we discovered we actually had to build, you know, a public project. We had to build a kennel with an office and then a house. And then there was this really fun interaction of how the cats could travel from the kennel to the house. So we had all these cool tunnels and 
<laughs> well, that, that's walkways and all kinds of crazy. <laughs> well, that, I mean, as wacky as that sounds, that sounds like it's a pretty fun project you get. It was a really fun project, and we had to go through a ton of city approvals because there was a lot of pushback because neighbors and businesses in the area were like, I don't want a dog kennel or a cat kennel next to my house. It's smelling, it's this and that. So we really had to put forth a very beautiful design that was, in my mind, a very high-end, cool design that had a lot of beautiful landscaping components, and the buildings were very airy with a lot of sliding doors and like barn doors and all kinds of great stuff. And I, I think it was a great design. So I think that helped hopefully help convince some of the neighbors that we weren't just putting up like a, you know, a trailer, like a lean to that was a dog kennel. <laughs> or <a> cat kennel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that that is something that is also unique. I think about architects is you're as much as we think of them again, architects building these giant pillars of glass and steel, you're, you're solving spatial problems. Is that the way, best way to put it? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great way to put it. And you're, yeah, you're dealing with like a lot of crazy conditions and you're trying to make a lot of people happy. <laughs> and as you solve these problems and as you focus on the design. So that's one whole part is just figuring out how the, how the heck to put this design together and make it amazing and make the spatial qualities beautiful. But then again, this goes back to what I was saying that the building is not just the building, it's the whole city and the site around it. Then you have to connect it to it its city you have to plug it in there and you have to make sure everyone around it and the community and whoever the sky the ground everything is is happy and it fits that sounds super easy i don't know why everyone's not doing it i mean <laughs> you know how hard can it be you know st stick stick a pool in the middle of it i mean the cats are fine i mean come on it's very it's very hard to do because yeah because you know you're you're focused on the drawings and as an architect when you know, as a student, when you graduate and you start working, you're very focused on how to do, draw details and how to get the set approved by the city and all these different codes that are regulating what you're doing. And it's hard to always think about all these other things going on. And I think architects don't get a lot of opportunity to work directly with the client. There's always go between. So that's where, to me, where B Lab is so interesting because our B Lab students are working with the clients, with the neighbors, with the community, they're going to be using the piece that we're building, designing and building. That makes sense because I, I know there's a class at the academy that seems like the class that all the students have the hardest time with, at least when I was there watching it, where I, I forget the gentleman's name, I forget the name of the class, but he's, it's basically going through all this code, all of these things. And the class I sat in on was your floor is rated for this much weight, but it's a factory. So you're going to put equipment on it. How much does the equipment weigh? And then you have the people that work that equipment and how many people are there and how much do they weigh? And that changes that. So now your design is now 17.4 inches. And I'm looking at the student's eyes gl glaze over and I'm going, whoa, this is way too much math. I got to run. But then if you think about that, there's 66 cats sitting on that floor, <laughs> that would be more interesting. <laughs> exactly, there you go. Exactly. How much is a, how much is a scratching post really weigh? But that right. makes sense. If you're working with the community, you got to know what it is they're actually going to do with it when you clean up and walk away. Right. So let's get into some of the projects because they, they are just, again, fascinating and not what we think about architecture, but seem like probably the most fun things a student can start out with. And I'm sure, I'm sure you're stealing a lot of students into community work and making them help people, which is just so wrong of you. <laughs> <laughs> terrible. So let's, let's talk uh, about the point perch. So you were coming into an already established idea or were you starting it from the ground up? Kind of explain point perch to us. That was our first project and it was completely started from the ground up. If that makes sense. So our executive director, Mimi Sullivan, her architecture firm was working in the Hunters Point neighborhood on renovating a lot of the housing units over there. And, you know, th this was a, a funded project. And when they were done, there wasn't a lot of budget left for the outdoor spaces. So there was a lot of kind of like dirt patches left over all over the place. So we took that as an opportunity to go in. So we knew we wanted to make something in one of those patches, but this is like, you know, a 10 block area, 10 square block area, so we had no idea. So what we did and what the students did really is we spent a whole summer organizing community meetings that we 
invited people to. We knocked on doors, we worked with existing nonprofits in the area to bring people to our meetings. And then we just listened to them as much as we could. We did activities, you know, we, there's all kinds of activities where you just get to know people. And then we started asking them like, what, you know, how do you use your community? What do you think of your community? What are all these spaces mean to you? And then we started saying, what would you want in these spaces? So that's kind of how we started the process. And then once we had all that information, we just kind of zoomed in on this one space that we thought would fulfill all the requirements. And the program and the people we had spoken to around there asked for a women's, a space for a women's empowerment group to meet, and also a space for local teenagers to have fashion shows. There was a nonprofit in one of the spaces right next door called, um, I think it was called Girls 2000, which was an advocacy group for young girls and an after school program. So these two programs kind of fit in with them. Just to explain, if you're for people who aren't familiar with Hunter's Point, Hunter's Point was at one time more of the industrial part of San Francisco. That was where all the ships came in, right? Yeah. And people came over here to work in the shipyards, I think, before World War II. And there was a large African-American population. So there was a large migration here to work in the shipyards. And then after, uh, during World War II, the Navy took over that site and built a lot of the housing that's there now, which was Naval housing. And then it eventually became public housing, turned over to the San Francisco Housing Authority, and they, which they, they did a very not nice job over there. And, the and, and that makes sense. I mean, well, not makes, not makes sense, but it, it, it's, it's one of those areas that has always received no support. So putting in grass, putting in trees, making it look pretty is not even on the top 100 things to do in the area. This is good. This is just concrete. Right. There's a lot of interest in the area and there's a lot happening. There's a couple of programs called the RAD program and HOPE housing program. And so a lot of new housing is getting built there, but there's also starting to be a danger of uh, gentrification happening down there as everywhere in the Bay Area. So there's a lot of high, you know, more high end market rate housing coming in over there, too. That's kind of exploiting the whole history of the shipyard. And so there's, you know. There's stuff going on. There's a whole, there's an issue of uh, ground pollution over there because of the shipyard. There was a lot of pollution after the war and the shipbuilding. So there's a lot going on, environmental justice issues. But people still have to live there and they should have a place that has community space and be enjoyable. When we started talking to people, people had lived there for two or three generations. Even people who had left were still coming back to visit or had moved back in. They had uncles and aunts, grandparents living there. So there was people, we met people working there who had worked in the shipyards. Oh, wow. Older people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was, there was some very, and we actually had a student who, I think it was his grandfather had worked in the shipyards. He, he later moved away and he grew up in Santa Cruz, but his, you know, his grandfather had been there. So he met this gentleman who's, who had worked there and they were having this great conversation. That's great. I mean, you're, you're helping a community that it's not going anywhere. They're not going to be chased out. Right. We need to support this area. Intergenerational community. And when you said, and and you made a point and, you know, the emphasis gets lost sometimes because we're unfortunately talking over Zoom and not face to face, where you said you, you listened to what people wanted. And that seems strange. (laughs) (laughs) Is that, is that, how much of that goes into what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, and, and that's kind of one of the core parts of this program that really the students take over this part is just listening. You know, we're, we're stepping in on a community that doesn't know us. We're coming in there and, you know, we're going to build something. And it's, it's our job to be guests in that community. It's our jobs to kind of leave our privilege behind and just listen to what people want. And once we listen and once we get what we need from them, then it's our job to use the skills that we're learning and the skills that we have that community members don't have, which is our training as architects and designers to make something. What was the end project for Point Perch? It was this outdoor gathering space. It was an undulating deck. We fabricated an interior frame as a waffle that we CNC'd using marine grade plywood. So the students fabricated that, took it out to site, and then we installed the deck and benches on site. And then we had a little area we painted to indicate a stage. 
need to break in here just for a minute because I have to remind you, please hit subscribe on whatever device you're listening to and head over to academyart.edu slash creative mind for our blog, links to our Facebook page, videos, and all the cool stuff that goes along with this episode, past episodes, and information on upcoming episodes. Now, back to the podcast. We'll put some of this stuff up online and so people can see it. It's actually, I mean, it's gorgeous. It looks, I mean, it, it's a beautiful addition to this area. And, you know, how, how, how was it received in the community? I think they really liked it. Everyone responded really positively and the neighbors we worked with really loved it. One of my regrets is we haven't gone back there enough to check on what's going on. Some of our other projects we've been able to keep in touch a little bit better. So we still need to follow up a little bit. But last time I checked in and looked, it was doing great. And people were, you know, sometimes people were just sitting there and, and chilling and it has a view of the bay because all of Hunter's Point, that whole area has these gorgeous views of the bay. <laughs> gorgeous, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about Point Pantry then, because that's that's something that is even less architecture in my mind. It's not a building. It's not. It's something that moves. Something that moves can't be architecture. I don't get it. You know, in the community-based design B-Lab program, we kind of cycle through what I call slightly larger projects and slightly smaller projects. We're not, we're not building buildings. So there's a, there's some, you know, fine tuning to that statement, but in between doing these larger projects and kind of amping up for the pavilion project, which was one of our biggest projects, we had to, we did the smaller project that was more of a prototype and a testing, I would say. We met with the community. We, um, we, there was a local food bank by the SF Marin food bank that was happening once a week in an outdoor space, but, you know, they often had it inside this very cramped community room when they couldn't fit outside or it was raining. And it was just kind of a mess. Like they, it was a lot of setup for them. When the food came over, they had to like bring out all these tables and move stuff around. And there was a lot of labor involved. So we thought we'd create a mobile set of furniture for them that would just kind of permanently stay in the space and just allow them to you know, put out the food and give it out to people in a great way. And the design was really spurred on by one of my students, Daniel, who, when he was a kid growing up in Southern California, he went to a lot of, you know, he had to go to food pantries with his mother on occasion through their life. And he said, he remembered two things about it. One, he remembered a lot of stigma and a lot of embarrassment for going there and feeling bad about it, even at a young age. But he also remembered this other side where he saw a lot of kids he knew and they played and hung out. And there was kind of this like celebratory aspect where they were just hanging out and it was like a little community event. So he wanted to bring that feel to this piece. So we included a lot of benches and seating and we put in these really bright, vibrant colors. When you look at it immediately, when it's done, you go, oh, I get it. This is built by an architect. Yeah. This has an architectural feel to it. This is not just a... Uh, uh, four legs and a, a seat in the back. It's like, yeah, there you go. It's a table, it's a chair. Yeah, yeah. run along. I want to say, you know, the students go through a pretty, a very long design process, no matter how small these projects are. They do research, they do diagramming, they build prototypes, they do 3D modeling, they build models. And because they are, you know, sometimes there's like seven students in the class collaborating, they have to negotiate that amongst themselves or, you know, through their professor, they have to, they have to figure out how to find a design that achieves the goals that we want, that's beautiful, but that they all agree on. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great skill to know because when you work in an architecture office, you are not in a corner designing by yourself. Right, right. It very rarely does somebody go, hey, here's a bunch of money. Go make me my building. See you in six months. <laughs> Just, you. Just you. Go for it. Have a <laughs> Don't hire anyone. I'm, I'm done. Uh, yeah. Don't ask anyone. I wrote yeah. you a deposit check. What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, one of the annoying things I would a lot of people find with these kind of star architect firms like, you know, Zahadid, like Zahadid is a, you know, when she's running a firm, 200 person firm or more than that. And, you know, so maybe she was the vision and the overall brand, but she was not the one doing the work. <laughs> A lot of artists and in, in the industrial arts will tell you the same thing. It's like, it may have this guy's name on it, this person's name on it, but it's a whole lab. It's a whole crew that's building this. Uh, respect all of the people involved in it. So let, let's talk about the Unity Pavilion, which is the most recent project you have going, have completed. 
I also wanted to say the intensity, even though the project and Point Pantry look small, the students basically in one semester, they did the design, they ran an Indiegogo campaign to raise funds. They did outreach to the community. They got owner approval. So they presented to the owner, got feedback, revised the design and finished it. They got approvals from the planning department for that project. They prototyped, they sourced materials, they fabricated it they installed on site and then they planned an opening event. So that was a 15 week process. I was going to say, if you didn't mention it, that, you know, you said semesters, like it's a 15 week semester. It's not six months, guys. This is nobody gets, nobody yeah. gets permits this fast. So yeah, kudos to them. As a misnomer that we're making these very small pro and the students come in with these expectations too. We're making these small projects, but it is a ton of work because you are building and fabricating the project for a real human being. This is not, something theoretical that you just have to justify to a jury. This is like, you have to justify it to human beings that are in the, you know, living their lives in their neighborhood. <laughs> and, I, and I think, you know, anybody that's ever built anything always forgets uh, that first one you make probably doesn't work really well. <laughs> You don't really want to sit in it or you're not going to be able to. <laughs> and in you're fact, have to make you know, more than one. Point Pantry had some uneven tabletops because we spent a lot of time being stuck to a certain design concept that didn't play out all the way. And so it wasn't well received by some people, <laughs> <laughs> which is okay. Like we love that. We want to learn. We want to know. Right, ex exactly. We want to throw our ideas out there, ideas out there. And we want to hear that this is not working because we need a flat tabletop duh to give out vegetables, you know? <laughs> 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 well, I'm glad, yeah, that saves me from having to ask you, like, so anything didn't really work out. As, uh, I know. I know no, stuff being... doesn't work out all the time, but we, you know, we keep rolling. That's part of the process. Oh, okay. Very cool. Very cool. So let's get into the Unity Pavilion, which is a, a much bigger project. There was an existing community garden that this really dedicated group of volunteers, mostly ladies, have been running and they live in the neighborhood. They've been there for over 10 years working on this project and they wanted to build a space where they could eat lunch or get some shade while they're working in the garden. For some reason, it's amazingly hot up there, even though Hunter's Point is kind of windy, but it's on a, a hill facing the bay and it, it just, it's very hot. So they just wanted a place to rest and also take in the beautiful views and look at the garden and get maybe people from the community to come out and have a barbecue there or, you know, spend some time there, hold a, hold a wedding. I don't know, hold some events there. So that was the impetus. And so they had the idea. I kind of randomly met one of the ladies running it through a connection through a friend who told me they were looking for some help. And so I just went up there one day and met her. And we got in on the whole grant process and we helped them apply for a grant because they were, you know, again, we were listening to them and they were the community, but they were missing architectural expertise and building expertise, as, you know, on these projects. So we gave that to them. And that's how the project started. We got a grant for, uh, the grant was almost for, I think it was $75,000 from the city of San Francisco. And, you know, our students provided the matching labor because our students did it pro bono because it was part of a class. So really, you know, that's how we got in there. And, you know, it was meant to be a place for cooking, eating, and storytelling. Which, you know, people often forget unless, you know, there's so much, you know, so many of us watch documentaries if we're trying to stay informed or we're seeing news and trying to stay informed. And then you look at places that you think community garden, you think it's oh, a couple of little old ladies growing vegetables. But in some areas, I mean, they're food deserts. These places that are growing food are because the only place where you can buy food is a liquor store. Yes. And Hunter's Point is absolutely a USDA classified food desert. There's so many people there who have to make these like, you know, weekly or monthly trips to a store by taking a taxi or an Uber because they can't get there, especially the elderly. There's very little access to fresh produce. So this garden produces tons of produce. You know, it's a very prolific garden. And this whole thing allowed us, the students really to dive into the history of Hunter's Point, the food history, right? Which, which is really interesting, like the food history of the Bayview. There was cattle grazing lands there. There was vegetable gardens there prior to World War II. There was a full shrimping industry in the area. And then there was a meat industry down in the Bayview, which is 
see how dog pat the name dog patch came around ah <laughs> uh, okay that makes sense <laughs> okay as as over there. yeah okay. that makes sense wow. wow so i mean that's i mean yeah that's that's you know as soon as you gentrify over that it's all gone for good yeah and then there's, you know, the the mission of the garden with the ladies, which was really interesting for all of us and the students to really understand is that they're trying to make a new connection or reconnect back to the land. You know, there's a lot of Hunters Point is an African American population and there's, you know, there's issues with just the connection, the history of the connection to the land is not a good history. And so it's really getting people back into the mindset that, hey, you know, the kids, like you can come out here and grow some, grow your own food, you can grow your own vegetables, you can grow anything, you can, you can start to learn how to cook if you want to. And that was what they, that's what they wanted to do with the garden. They wanted to make it a place of like cooking and storytelling and going over the history of the place and like really like loving, you know, fresh food again. What was the idea of this pavilion? When I think of pavilion, is it something like a, a gazebo or what, what space were we creating, were you creating in this community garden? The basic design was based on this idea of frames and it was an idea of framing the view to the bay and, and also framing views to the garden. The NCH garden team, which is the volunteers we work with, really, really wanted a space where they could just kind of sit out and gaze upon the garden and relax and look at the bay. And then the, the way the seating is organized and the mobile kitchen unit that moves around in the middle, that's organized to move between a space where people can sit and eat and relax or have a social event to creating a space for teaching where somebody can take this kitchen table as a demonstration space and show how to, you know, prepare some kind of dish or food to an audience sitting over there. So this is truly a, a, a community, out, an outdoor community center with, you know, a billion dollar view. Yes, that's what we were trying to do. I hope so. <laughs> and again, I'm going to, we got to put all these pictures up, but it's, it's gorgeous. I mean, it really is when you look at this, this area and, you know, people forget how pretty the area really is and you're like, oh man. We got to make something that shows it off and gives this community pride. The client asked for redwood because it's a it's local to California and she loved the material. And they, you know, they asked for that material. They and the design was kept fairly simple just for us to fit into budget and for us to build it ourselves. But the detailing's really exquisite because the students went nuts detailing all the connections and building the benches, you know, some of it. Maybe you look at it and parts of it are overwrought, but it was part of a design theme that continued. So every piece of redwood they took, they planed down to a two by two piece for the benches and then they chamfered all the edges. So they, they went through this super repetitive process to create beautiful pieces of wood that eventually became parts of the bench. <laughs> some of the, the small, again, some of the smaller pieces that you were telling me about, like the mobile food carts and, and ramen carts, what is the drive behind that from an architectural standpoint? The Gorilla Coffee Cart, that's what we call it. The Gorilla Coffee Unit, sorry, the GCU. And then the Gorilla no Noodle Unit, the GNU, the new. <laughs> you know? Yeah, those were, those were both, you know, shorter five-week projects that happened in the second year studio that I also teach. So B-Lab kind of dips and reaches into the second year program as well. It can dip into any class we want if, if a faculty member wants it or is interested. So the theme of the second year class was designing homeless shelters and designing for the homeless. So we found one of the biggest barriers was understanding our client. You know, we all have stereotypes of the homeless, especially at our campus on Fifth and Brandon. There's a lot of homeless people on Fifth Street and a lot of students experience it daily when they come to campus. So we thought we needed a device to break the ice and give us a reason to speak with people who are experiencing homelessness. So the coffee cart is designed as sort of a community kitchen table. The students roll it out. The students make and prepare the coffee and give it to people experiencing homelessness. And while they're doing that, they engage them in conversation and they just try to find out something about themselves. And just, you know, sharing a cup of coffee and sharing conversation. And again, how is that architecture? But it is. Yeah. It, 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 this is something that you're going to be using daily and it has to be designed and it needs to be designed well. 
yeah, it needs to be durable. It needs to work. It needs to satisfy all the requirements of, you know, serving coffee. Like there needs to be a space for milk, for space for trash, for sugar, but it also needs to be beautiful. We don't want to go out to someone experiencing homelessness with like, you know, a little cart on wheels that breaks when we stop and serve them coffee. Right. I mean, the implications of that are horrific, right? We want to go out with this beautiful jewel of an object that the graphics on the side of the Gorilla Coffee Cart were uh, CNC'd in, but it came from a graphic a student created that said, we belong here. And, you know, so that was integrated into the piece. There was chairs integrated so somebody could sit with us and talk if they wanted to. And really, you know, understanding the stories and the narrative of a person and becoming empathetic or finding commonalities with people really strengthened the students' design projects so much at the end of the semester because they were not designing for a blank stereotype. They were designing for a person. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because empathy has been coming up a lot in a lot of the talks I've been having with people. And it was not something I was really taught when I went to art school. And certainly it's not something you're taught a lot in life, unfortunately. (laughs) But it seems like empathy is a major point for what you're doing. How are you getting students to start thinking that way? It's not that hard when the students take the coffee cart out and serve a coffee to to someone experiencing homelessness and have a 10 minute conversation with them about their life. They guaranteed every single time they find commonalities with that person to either themselves or to someone they know. People, you go out and speak to someone who's homeless, like there's a good chance they went to college, they were in the military. There's so many overlaps with our students that people start to realize that, oh, this is just a person who's had you know, a series of unfortunate events happen to them. And if they start to see that as a person who's had unfortunate events and just needs a place to recover and get back into society or just needs help with certain things in their life, then the design can be accommodated to that and a homeless shelter can be designed to be more successful, right? A successful homeless shelter just sounds, you know, it sounds like a political minefield, but I understand what you're saying because it's like, no, this, if you can design something good, why are you going to disrespect yourself and somebody else by making crappy design? I mean, the design of a lot of quote, emergency overnight homeless shelters are, you know, they're quickly designed to just provide the basic services, but they cause, we've heard this from homeless activists and people we've talked to, they cause PTSD because people go into the shelter and they're three foot away from somebody who is really unstable and they perceive it to be unsafe and they sleep all night on this cot, like grabbing onto their belongings, most of which they had to leave outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And they can't bring their pet in, they can't bring a partner in. And it's like a very, again, like the pantry, it's dehumanizing to get the students into a mindset or all of us into a mindset where we can design something that's humanizing, but it's still beautiful architecture. We need to go through that exercise of empathy. What's some of the next projects that B-Lab is looking to get into and how do you go about finding those projects? So the current project we're working on is called Kid of Parts. (laughs) Students name these, so it's a pretty clever name, but This is also coming through a relationship with a nonprofit that we had in Hunters Point. And there's a building called the Bayview Commons Apartments that's in the Bayview. And they have this courtyard that just needs some love. It's an affordable housing project. There's 29 kids living in the building. So the students decided to design what's called this intergenerational place. 29 kids. That's a lot. That's a lot of kids. Yes. And then, you know, compounded, we started this project in January and then, you know, COVID hit and the lockdown started and we found, you know, a lot of the, a lot of families are in these two bedroom apartments with like four kids (laughs) you know, all on Zoom and the kids are going crazy. This whole project was focused on kids because we love working with kids and the students enjoy working with kids, especially you know, the younger students, because they can, they just connect so well to kids. They, they think they won't. They're like, I don't know anything about kids. And like, yeah, you do. <laughs> you know? yeah, it wasn't you that long ago. Remember. You were one, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, you love it. And, uh, yeah. and so we started working with the kids on Zoom and it was really great. And, you know, all our great plans for youth workshops were dashed and they never came back. And, but we, we did it remotely and we got to actually work with kids one-on-one. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, it wasn't a perfect process. Like there was, there was a lot of mayhem on Zoom, and you know, like, yeah, we're we're all learning how to f- figure this yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> hard to get hold of people and all that, but you know, but I think the students have were luckily uh, allowed to use the shop at Washington, um, the industrial design shop this summer, and they've begun fabrication on it. So we're still cranking through this project, and we're hoping to get it built this fall. I mean, obviously the irony is a lot of the objects we're designing are industrial design scale. That was the first thing I saw. I was like, huh. But as you've explained it, it does make a lot of sense. If you're an industrial designer coming and doing uh, a semester or two in the B lab makes total sense because you're working with somebody directly. So I, I want to, you know, kind of to wrap it up. You mentioned a lot of times that you're working with nonprofits you're working with grants and you're working with volunteers and you're working with kids and you're working with disadvantaged people. And this is kind of a loaded question. How does somebody make a living? How can you make a living doing that? There are many firms that do. I know we're back to affordable housing, but housing is one of them. There are many firms that build community centers, that build schools, this is kind of a one-off thing, B-Lab, where you get to work directly with the client and it's about, you know, teaching about the process and the kind of what it's like to be in real life with all the chaos and mayhem and vibrancy. But, you know, in general, a lot of firms out there design projects that benefit community. Firms design public spaces, they de- design public schools, they design, you know, public museums. And any of these projects can have this attitude of, empathy and community engagement brought to them. And I think that's what we're really trying to underline. So we're not necessarily saying, hey, go out and make a career doing this, but we're trying to teach these larger ideas that, hey, involving people, involving community is important. And, you know, making sure your design reaches the people it's made for is important. And there's money behind it. And it, it uh, you know, let me rephrase that, that, that these projects are not volunteer projects there there is financial backing to this these are real world projects that are being paid for there are a lot of firms that do work like this that are very successful firms some of them run off of grants some of them run off of you know private commissions but there are firms doing this and they're no in my mind they're not less successful than a firm doing high end design most of the students I've had have found this type of a project to be really a great thing for their portfolio as they go out into the world and look for jobs because they can show that they have worked with real people, that they have detailed real things, that they have been out in the field and figured out how to put something together, and that they can you know, see a whole project through from start to finish. And that is, is something that's very rare in a new graduate to have as you go into a firm. It sounds crude, but, you know, I get to be crude, you know, that there is there is money in helping people because it's not free and people understand that it costs money to do this stuff. The architecture profession is not nearly as diverse as it should be, but there's been changes underfoot. They're slow in coming, but they're coming. And, you know, recent events and movements might help this out. So the more people that get into architecture that more accurately reflect the population of this country, the more these you know projects in neighborhoods that might be overlooked right now, those projects are gonna start and they're gonna be just as lucrative or important as the projects happening now. So there you have it. A good look into building a better world for us all to live in. It sounds lofty, but it's extremely possible and is worth taking the time to study and design for. And as more and more art and design career opportunities are on the rise, employers are on the hunt for the next generation of talented and skilled creative professionals. And here at Academy of Art University, you will get those work-ready skills that employers want. You can study on-site in downtown San Francisco or anywhere in the world with our online programs. So to request info about our 40 plus areas of study in art and design, including architecture, game development, UX design, animation, and more, visit our website at academyart.edu slash creative mind. I'm Bobby Brill, and thanks for listening.